Hey Optimancers, Treant Monk here. Today we're going to be talking about our 7th level wizard spells and I get a lot of comments now about people asking about builds for wizards so what's going to be happening is I'm doing my 7th level wizard spell guide today next week we'll be doing our 8th level then we'll be doing our 9th level and then we're going to be doing all kinds of build guides. We're going to do a build guide for every single subclass of wizard. Now my plan for that is instead of kind of building the same wizard over and over and over again except with a different subclass, I'm going to show you some different ways to build wizards. We're going to do a little bit of multi-classing with some. Others will be straight classed. Uh, some will be focused on battlefield control. Others will be focused on mixing melee and combat. So there will be some various kinds of ways to build your wizard. Lots of different options. The reason I'm saving them all for the end is I wanted to do all these other videos first so I would explain the why before I start explaining the how. So today we're going to be doing our 7th level spells. We're going to do our standard ranking. That is red if I don't think the spell is very good. Orange if I think that the spell is good in a circumstantial way. Purple if I think the spell is okay and a decent choice for your preparation list. Green if I think it's a good spell. And blue if I think it's a must have. So let's get started. As always, I'm going to be doing these one school at a time, ranking the spells from my favorite to my least favorite. The first school we're going to talk about is Abjuration, and there's only one spell for Abjuration, and that spell is Symbol. Now, Symbol is a spell that it essentially creates a trap, right? So you cast it, takes a minute to cast, so you're not casting it in combat. And then if any creatures or creatures you designate or a trigger you designate happen, it goes off and it can have a number of different effects. Some of them are pretty crappy, but other ones are pretty good. Uh, the best one I would say is the stun effect. Stun is a pretty debilitating condition. They can be stunned for a minute. They don't get another saving throw. Uh, so in terms of a trap, it's a decent trap. The problem is first it costs a thousand gold pieces and the spell consumes that. And that's a terrible cost for one trap. And the second is, and this is kind of a bigger deal to me, uh, if I look at a spell like, say, Glyph of Warding, which is a third level spell, I can put an area of effect spell, any area of effect spell, into Glyph of Warding, and then that spell is costing me 200 gold pieces. So is Symbol really offering me that much more? I mean, it has a good area of effect, and I guess it is somewhat advantageous to be able to cast it in a minute compared to an hour. But we're talking about four different levels of spells, and five times the cost. I just can't justify that. So I just can't recommend Symbol. So that brings us into our Conjuration spells. My favorite Conjuration spell at seventh level is Teleport. Uh, so uh, you know what Teleport does, but the thing I like about Teleport is we can include our allies that are within 10 feet. So that's a pretty good range. Quite often we have to be within five feet. So being able to be within 10 feet means if we're going to use this as an escape from maybe a combat that's gone wrong or something like that, teleport's going to be more versatile. It's going to be more useful to you than other spells like that. Uh, and when we look at spells like Dimension Door that kind of had that purpose beforehand, teleport's obviously a lot better because we can take our entire party and we don't have to be next to them. And of course, we can always use this as utility, just as a travel spell. Uh, now, the thing about teleport is it's not perfect, right? So if you know a place that you're traveling to, you're going to be rolling on a table to determine if you end up exactly where you intended to be or nearby, or you could end up with a mishap. And with a mishap, you can take damage. But the damage isn't too bad. It's 3d10, so as long as you guys aren't near death, that probably shouldn't be a problem. But the workaround is this. What I tend to do if I have the teleport spell or if a party member has a teleport spell is when we find places that we might want to teleport to again. So maybe it's our home base or maybe it's an ally's home base, or maybe it's just an area we expect to return to, go ahead and take a rock or something from there. Because if you have an object that is from that location, you prevent any chance of mishap, and the teleportation ends up being perfect every time. Uh, that will last for six months. After that, you need to replace that object. So if you're using this as a getaway, you definitely want to do that, because you don't want to be risking a mishap if you've got party members that are close to down. 
My second favorite spell for Conjuration, and this is close, Teleport and this spell are neck and neck, is Plane Shift. So Plane Shift, for one, can be used as a getaway spell too. Uh, now the difference is, with Plane Shift, you have to be touching the creatures or they have to be touching each other. So the idea is you all gather hands together and then you Plane Shift together. So as a getaway spell, it's not as good as Teleport. Now it'll take you to another plane, you describe where you're going in that plane, and you go to that general area. There's no chance of mishap like there is with teleport, uh, and if you have a teleportation circle you can go to, you can go exactly where you want to go. So technically speaking, as a utility spell, you can use this like a teleport spell. If I am on one end of a world and I want to get to the other end of the world, I can cast maybe plane shift to some kind of friendly plane that we know, that we know isn't dangerous, and then cast plane shift again, and go back to the world, but this time to the area we wanted to go. So you have to use two spells instead of one, but often if this is off time, that's not a big deal. Uh, another thing I like about Plane Shift is there is an offensive use as well. If we use it as a touch spell against an enemy, they get teleported to the plane of our choice. So maybe we have a dragon, a white dragon, and we can send it to the plane of fire or something like that. Now again, this is one of those spells that provides a saving throw, and if the saving throw is successful, nothing happens. So that tends not to be my favorite use for it, but it gives it a little bit of versatility. And the nice thing is, is say compared to a Banish, this does not have a duration or concentration. My next favorite conjuration spell at this level is Morden Kanan's Magnificent Mansion. Now this spell mechanically, I think is okay. Thematically, I love it. I love this spell thematically, but I can't give it a high rating because mechanically it's fine. So what the spell does is it creates this extra dimensional space uh, that you move into through a portal. You can choose who can go through the portal and who can't go through the portal, and you can make the portal invisible. Uh, so it is one of those things where if you want your allies to go through and you don't want anyone else to go through, you can do that. It's pretty much 100% safe. Uh, inside the extra dimensional space, you have basically a palace. You can arrange it however you want. There's a certain size range, but you can fit a lot of creatures in there if you wanted to. This palace is furnished however you wish. Uh, there are servants. There are essentially like unseen servants all over the place, except you can have them look kind of ghostly however you want them to, and they'll do anything that you or any of the other guests want them to do. Uh, so you can have them serve you or tend your wounds or anything like that. Uh, then there's food there as well. They say it's enough to serve a hundred people, a nine course meal, uh, or 10 halflings, a nine course meal, and then you have this mansion for 24 hours. So technically you could take a small army in there, feed them all, have them all rest, uh, take a full day of entire safety, and then go out again. So as a safe rest spell, this is probably the best spell in the game, uh, even better than Demiplane. Uh, not a lot better than Demiplane, but a little bit better than Demiplane. Rest spells, how useful are they at this point? We've had lots of good rest spells before. I guess the big advantage here is we can fit a lot more people, uh, and then thematically it's kind of fun. So overall, it's an okay spell. I kind of really like it on a thematic basis, but, but in terms of objectively rating this spell, I have to say it's okay. This brings us into divination. We only have one divination spell. It's not very good. It's power word pain. Uh, so power word pain, you're choosing one target and that target needs to have 100 hit points or less. If that target has over 100 hit points, nothing happens. If it has less than 100 hit points, then it's going to get disadvantage on a lot of things. Disadvantage on attack rolls, disadvantage on ability checks, disadvantage on saving throws, everything except for constitution. Kind of wish constitution was in there as well, because a lot of the best single target save or suck spells are constitution based. But we can find other spells as well. So I guess the idea here is if we were to use this in pairing with another spell, we could set up disadvantage on a saving throw. We can also make it harder for them to cast spells, but we're talking about disadvantage here, but we're talking about disadvantage here, we're talking about 7th level spells too. Uh, disadvantage isn't that big a deal for this level of spell, and this is single target, and then at the end of every one of their turns they're going to get a saving throw, constitution saving throw. And if they make it, then the effect disappears. So we have all kinds of bad stuff here. We have to guess their number of hit points. It has to be less than 100. We're at the level where 
Less than 100 hit points is not very many hit points. Creatures we're fighting can have hundreds of hit points. So guessing when they're under 100 and at a point where this battle isn't almost already over doesn't happen very often. Then, if we cast a spell and they have under the 100 hit points, we're giving them disadvantage, which isn't horribly debilitating compared to some of the other things we can do to creatures, uh, often without a saving throw. Uh, and then we're going to give them a saving throw every round, so we can't count on this lasting more than one round. So all those things put together make this a pretty crappy spell, uh, one I definitely don't recommend. So that brings us into Evocation. We have a few different Evocation spells, and they really run the gambit from fantastic to terrible. Uh, my favorite Evocation spell at this level, and one of my favorite spells all together, is Force Cage. So Force Cage if you remember my 5th level spell video talking about Wall of Force and how amazing Wall of Force is for that level, Force Cage is the evolution of Wall of Force and what an evolution it is. Uh, Force Cage is a cubicle cage, it's 10 by 10 feet, but we can make it barred and then we can double those dimensions. So we can do 20 feet by 20 feet. Technically speaking, that's the size of a gargantuan creature. So we can trap pretty much any creature in a Force Cage. Now, people have pointed out to me that there's some creatures in the game that are gargantuan that we would still assume that if they're stretched out, they're going to be more than 20 feet long. Like a Tarask, for example, is clearly much, much longer than 20 feet. Uh, so it's going to depend a little bit on your DM determining, I mean, you got a creature that's filling a 20 by 20 foot space, uh, they're going to have to decide whether there's any extremities outside of that because if there is then the force cage doesn't work but assuming we've got a creature we can trap when you get them in the force cage they are so screwed first off it's really hard to teleport out of a force cage wall of force you can just teleport out force cage prevents teleportation you can technically do it but it requires a saving throw it's not easy to do uh, secondly it's pretty much indestructible thirdly it's not using your concentration so it's not even like you can be targeted as a way of dropping the force cage because that force cage is going to last an hour without your concentration uh, and finally it's invisible and this was brought up to me recently, and I think it's an interesting question, uh, because we often talk about disintegrate as a way of taking care of Wall of Force and Force Cage. But it was pointed out to me that if you actually read the description of disintegrate, it says that you can target a creature or an object you can see. Uh, so Force Cage is invisible, Wall of Force is invisible, do you need to be able to see invisible to be able to target them with the disintegrate? I don't know if this has been answered anywhere. So if any of you know the answer, let me know in the comments down below. I mean, technically speaking, I've always had it that a disintegrate will work on a force cage or a wall of force. But regardless of whether disintegrate works on force cage without a see invisibility or not, uh, doesn't matter. Force cage is an amazing spell that wins combat, no saving throw. Uh, again, we're talking about the divide and conquer thing, but with Force Cage, we actually have another option, because if we make the bigger Force Cage that has the bars, then technically speaking, some effects could probably get in and out. For example, if you had to cast an area of effect spell, it's likely going to affect the area within the Force Cage. So we've done things in the past where you get a dragon in a Force Cage, and then you throw a moonbeam above it and walk away, and eventually that moonbeam is going to kill it. Uh, so we have the method now to attack the creature within the effect. So we put all this stuff together. We have the versatility of bars or no bars, much greater size, no concentration. Uh, and so this becomes a big improvement over Wall of Force. And Wall of Force was already a great spell. So Force Cage, again, one of my favorite spells for wizards at any level. My next favorite evocation spell at this level is Crown of Stars. So you cast Crown of Stars and you get these seven motes and they're spinning around your head, keeping your eye on stones company. Uh, and the way it works is it doesn't use concentration and then once each turn using your bonus action you can fire one of those motes at an enemy you make a ranged spell attack and if that attack succeeds it does 40 12 damage so that's about 26 points of damage now that's not great damage for this level but just it doesn't use concentration and if we're not using our bonus action for anything else then it's 26 points of damage in addition to everything else we're doing on the turn, because assumably we're probably concentrating on a different spell, using our action on casting different spells. So this 26 damage is just a bonus. 
And when we look at it from that perspective, suddenly 26 damage isn't so bad. So now we have this spell. It's not interfering in the other things we're doing unless we're doing something that requires a bonus action. This isn't something I'm going to be combining with something like animate objects that's going to be using our bonus action. But most spells don't require a bonus action. And this isn't going to interfere with our concentration either. So because we can put this together with all those other things and just do that extra damage, overall I think this is a pretty good spell. My next favorite spell at this level is Whirlwind. So Whirlwind if we talk about Force Cage being kind of the next evolution of Wall of Force, then Whirlwind is kind of the next evolution of Watery Sphere that we talked about at fourth level. Because it creates a very similar effect. And it has a great range, 300 feet, and we can move it around the battlefield as we wish. And as it hits creatures, it sucks them up. And they make a saving throw, and if they fail their saving throw, they're restrained. And then each round that they're in the effect, they move 5 feet upwards. So they're moving up the Whirlwind is kind of the idea. Uh, on their turn, they can make a strength check or a dexterity check, not saving throw, so they can't use legendary resistance or anything like that. So they're making that check, and if they make that check, then they're expelled out of the whirlwind. Uh, so we're creating the restraint condition, we can hit multiple creatures with it, it's an effect we can move it around the battlefield as we need, it has a good range, uh, and if a creature reaches the top, they'll be taking falling damage, and even if they make their strength or dexterity check to get out, they're going to be flung in a random direction a fair distance, and that could take them out of the combat for maybe another round or two. Uh, so we can do Divide and Conquer that way as well. Now Restrained, uh, with a 7th level spell, is no big deal. Uh, now, because we can affect multiple creatures with it, and we can continue to affect more creatures with it, I still think this is an okay spell, but still... Restrained at 7th level is not as big a deal as many of the other things we can do. So overall, an okay spell. Uh, the effect is a little bit minor for me for the level, uh, but overall, as a battlefield control, I think it does its job. My next favorite spell at this level is Delayed Blast Fireball. Uh, now, a lot of people really like this spell. I think it is maybe okay in a very niche way. Uh, in general, this spell does as much damage as an upcast fireball. So from that perspective, it's terrible. It also uses your concentration. So it's actually worse than an upcast fireball if we're just using it as a fireball. The only reason to ever use this spell is to delay it. Because if we delay it, we can delay it up to a minute. So that's 10 rounds. And each round, the damage of this spell increases by 1d6. So technically speaking, if we can wait a minute and then have this spell explode, then we are doing an additional 10d6 damage, and suddenly the spell damage is pretty good. So how often does that happen, where you have a minute for which you can set up this spell to have it go off? And it's using your concentration, so you're not doing other things during that time. There are cases, but they don't come up a lot. Certainly as a straight-out combat spell, I think this spell is garbage. You should never use it for that. You're only going to really use it if you can set it up beforehand, your enemies are unaware or unable to get rid of it, and then it does pretty good damage to those enemies. Uh, probably, if we're talking about CR-appropriate enemies, it's not going to kill them, right? Uh, because adding 10d6 damage, we're talking about 35 additional points of damage to creatures that have hundreds of hit points. Uh, so we're not killing them with a... Delayed Blast Fireball, it's not a game changer, even in the situations where you can use it. Uh, keep in mind that if you do have it in a combat or somewhere where an enemy can see it, they can make a saving throw, dex saving throw, and if they succeed, they can pick up the effect and they can throw it. They can throw it right back at you. Uh, so there's definitely lots of downsides here, and the upsides are pretty small. I'm still going to give an orange rating because I think in the right circumstances, it's okay. Uh, I don't think it's as good as some other orange rank spells in those circumstances, but it's a little bit between red and orange for me, but I think because there is those niche uses for it, I can justify an orange rating. Now we've got a couple really bad evocation spells. Let's talk about the first one. It's Prismatic Spray. Uh, so Prismatic Spray, it's a cone. It's a big cone, 60-foot cone, uh, but the effects here just do not cut it. So first, let's keep in mind that cones are hard to place. I'm not a big fan of cone spells for wizards because if we're behind the party, it's very hard to avoid friendly fire. So we kind of have to go up. And then, of course, the effect is very narrow, close to your character, and it's only wide, far from your character. So you have to be kind of in front of your party, but still enough back from the enemies that you can 
fit a number of enemies in the effect. So I don't love cones. Uh, but even if you get some enemies in this cone, the effects are not good. You roll randomly with each enemy that's hit to determine what happens to them. Uh, but spoiler, 60 plus percent of them are going to take 10d6 damage. 10d6 damage with a 7th level spell. That is absolutely pathetic. Now, you do have a chance of some other things happening, but by and large, they're not overly impressive. We have a chance to blind them. We have a chance to restrain them. Now, in both those cases, if they fail multiple saves, worse things happen, but they have to fail multiple saves. Uh, and then finally, the only one that's really good is you have the chance of multiple effects occurring. So technically speaking, we could do 20d6 damage with this effect or blinded and 10d6 damage with this effect, which is good, but but a one in eight chance of that happening. So seven out of eight times, they're either gonna take crappy damage, save for half, blinded, restrained. These are not the effects we want from a seventh level spell. Never mind the fact that the effect is random and random isn't good, right? Because we can't choose what we're gonna do to the enemies. Being able to choose is always better than random because we can use it tactically, right? In some cases, restraint is really good. In some cases, it's not so good. So if we can't choose when that's going to happen, that makes it even worse. So there's all kinds of things that make this spell a pretty bad spell. Uh, well worth a red rating. But the worst spell of evocation and probably the worst 7th level spell is Mordenkainen's Sword. Uh, remember Crown of Stars? Uh, maybe when I was telling you about Crown of Stars, you thought, you know, that spell sounds okay, except it kind of bums me out that it does so much damage and that it doesn't use my concentration. Well, then this is the spell for you, because Mordenkainen and Sword does less damage than Crown of Stars, and it uses your concentration. And the upside is, there is no upside. We also have to move it. So if it's not in the right location, it may not even be able to attack on your turn. Everything about Mordenkainen and Sword is a huge disappointment. We're spending our concentration on an effect that's really not doing very much, uh, and is a pain in the butt to move around. It's awful, and it's easily the worst seventh level spell in the game. And it really would be probably the worst six level spell in the game too, even if it was a lower level. Morgan's Sword is just this huge pile of crap. So go from one of the worst spells to one of the best spells. Let's talk about Illusion. And of course, our number one choice for Illusion is Simulacrum. Uh, Simulacrum, I've talked about many times because it is one of those spells that differentiate wizards from all the other spellcasters. Simulacrum, if you don't know, you spend 12 hours to cast it, so this is not a combat spell. Uh, and you cast it on yourself or somebody else, and you create a copy of them. The copy has less hit points, but it has all their abilities. Uh, so if you cast it on yourself, you create a mimic of yourself, it has all the spells that you currently have prepared. Uh, and then when it casts them, it can't get them back, but so what? That is so powerful. Never mind the fact it has your other abilities too. If you're a diviner, it's going to have your portent, etc., etc. Simulacrum is friendly to you. It obeys your commands. There's no issues with control. The only downside of this spell is it does cost 1,500 gold pieces to cast. Well, well worth it. That's the bargain of the century. If you are a wizard and you are of the level to take Simulacrum, this has got to be your first selection. This is the reason you're playing a wizard. My next favorite illusion spell at this level is Mirage Arcane. And I've had some significant conversations with people about Mirage Arcane on this channel. Because what Mirage Arcane does is it's basically an illusion spell that includes touch. And that's really important. Uh, because we take this huge area, we can cast it up to a mile. Uh, and we can change the terrain however we want. Uh, we can create chasms, stairs, we can create structures. Uh, and those structures or terrain effects affect your sense of touch. So technically speaking, if you create a wall, I can't get through that wall because I move to it and it feels like a hard service. So that means as a battlefield control, this can be used effectively. Uh, also, if we're an illusionist and we have malleable illusions, we can change this as we need to. Now, there's some limitations here. And this is where we're going to talk about uh, some comments I had. I had somebody mention to me, you could do a lava flow and destroy a city with it. 
They also mentioned that you could take a city and you could raise adamantine walls around the city, making it impenetrable to attack. Uh, but there are some limitations here. I think we need to talk about them. The first is this spell cannot conceal anyone. Uh, so if you are casting this spell and you create a wall in front of you and it would conceal you from your enemies, you can't do that. If you want to create a wall around a city and there's people in that city, you can't do that. So that is a really important limitation. The second thing is this is an illusion. You're tricking somebody's senses. So when you create a wall, it's not really a wall. It's not actually there. So I might not be able to get through it because it's tricking my sense of touch. So I get to it and it feels solid. Uh, but does that mean that lava is going to destroy walls? Well, I would say that the walls don't have a sense of touch. They're an inanimate object. So they're not going to be affected by an illusion. Uh, and it was then commented back that that could create some weird situations. Imagine for a moment you create a mirage arcane and maybe there's a mirage hill uh, and then you're traveling in a cart and then you move up to the hill. Does the cart move up the hill? Because the cart doesn't have a sense of touch. Uh, but if it doesn't move through the hill, what happens when you hit the hill? It creates some weird effects. And I think what it comes down to is your DM is just going to have to make a call, right? Uh, but I do think Mirage Arcane is an illusion. Even though it affects your sense of touch, it is an illusion. You're tricking the mind rather than creating physical things. And for that reason, I don't think this spell is an amazing spell. But as an illusion spell and a spell that kind of affects terrain, if we look at our progression of Silent Image, Major Image, uh, Hallucinatory Terrain, Mirage Arcane is kind of the ultimate of that because the affecting sense of touch is a pretty big deal. Now we could talk about this for a while. If I create stairs and I walk up the stairs, am I actually walking up the stairs? If it's just affecting my mind, how is that happening? Maybe I'm not actually up those stairs at all. We could talk and talk and talk. Your DM's gonna have to work it out. Uh, the idea is it's an illusion. It affects your sense of touch. That's all. So let's move on to my least favorite illusion spell at this level, which is project image. Uh, so project image creates an image of yourself. Uh, and then that image, you can see through its eyes, hear through its ears, move it around. Now in previous editions with project image, you could cast spells through the image and that was kind of cool. We can't do that anymore. Uh, and so that's pretty big disappointment here, but mainly this spell, I see it used as a divination spell because we can cast this up to 500 miles to any place we've been before. Uh, and then, so we can use that, we can send ourselves there. So it could be used for long range communication. It could also be used for scouting or just for scrying, right? Because we can see and hear what's going on and we can move around. It can move around at twice your speed. Uh, now, considering the level of spell, those aren't huge effects. Uh, but if this is the spell you have and you need those effects, uh, then it does do the job. So overall, I'm going to give it an orange rating. I don't think it's a terrible spell. Now I should say that, I mean, technically speaking, we could p maybe use it to trick enemies into thinking that we're there. Uh, so you send it into negotiations or something and they don't know that you didn't actually arrive. Uh, so there might be some niche uses for it beyond that. But in general, I would say this is a spell that for the most part is going to be a divination spell for you and an okay divination spell, but not great for a seventh level spell. So let's get into our necromancy spells. There's only one and that's finger of death. Uh, so what finger of death does is you target a single enemy and if they fail their saving throw, you can expect to do over 60 points of damage to them. If they make their saving throw, they take half. So if we're using this as a combat spell, I would say it's at least one step above disintegrate. Now, if you didn't watch that video, I don't like Disintegrate as a combat spell, and I don't like Finger of Death as a combat spell, but I do think it's better as a combat spell than Disintegrate if you're choosing one or the other. Now, the saving throw is Constitution. That's not the save we would choose. Uh, but the final thing about this spell, and the one thing that kind of makes it interesting in the right circumstances, is that if you kill a creature using Finger of Death, it rises as a zombie under your control. So... Technically speaking, you have a ton of off time. You're an evil wizard. You can go around killing people with this and you can create potentially an undead army that's permanent with this spell. Uh, and if you're a necromancer, they're going to get the bonuses from your undead thralls. So in the right circumstances, this spell has use. 
as a straight combat spell, I don't recommend it. If you're wondering about this spell as just a blast, I would rate it red. The reason I'm rating it orange is specifically for the use of creating all the zombies, which I think doesn't come up all that often, so it's definitely not more than orange. So that brings us into our transmutation spells. My favorite transmutation spell at this level is reverse gravity. Now, I don't think reverse gravity is an amazing spell because there are some limitations based on the time we get it. Uh, because what happens is you create this massive, massive uh, effect. It's 50 foot radius, so that's 100 feet wide. Uh, and it's a cylinder, and any creature within it has to make a dexterity saving throw. And if they fail their saving throw, they fall upwards. Uh, and the idea is they fall upwards up to 100 feet. If there's, you know, a ceiling or something, they hit the ceiling, and they would take falling damage just as they normally would. Uh, but if they don't, then they would rise to the 100 feet, and they would just remain there for the duration of the spell. Um, but the limitations here are, we are at the level where a lot of creatures are going to have movement beyond just walking. Uh, they're going to have flight, or be able to teleport, or dimension door, or whatever. So there's a lot of creatures that are going to have a way out of this right away. Uh, if they have flight, it's basically not affecting them at all. And that's not all that rare at this level. So a lot of creatures are not going to be affected by reverse gravity at this level. That's the biggest downside here. Uh, if the creatures are affected, they are sent up the 100 feet or however long it is. Maybe they take some falling damage. And if they are using melee as their primary source of attack, you can prevent them from doing that. Now, this does have friendly fire. We're not choosing our enemies. So if your allies don't have flight, they might fall upwards too. Uh, you might fall upwards too. So all things to think about if you're casting this spell is how do you take care of yourselves with that? Uh, if the creatures make their saving throw, and this is important and a little vague, if creatures make their saving throw, it says that they're able to grab onto something, and that's why they don't fall upwards. So does that require a free hand? I would say as a DM, I would say probably yes. How is that going to affect things for them moving forward? Because essentially the spell description suggests to me that they're still affected by this spell. They're just able to grab onto something, and that's preventing them from falling upwards. So are they hanging upside down, hanging onto something? If so, then they're pretty much incapacitated. And then this spell would be amazing. And and it's really vague on what happens. It just says they grab onto something so they don't, don't fall upwards. So your DM may play this in different ways. And depending how they play it, you might find this more effective. Uh, if you play it just straight by the rules, they grab onto something. Presumably that requires one free hand. And then they're unaffected by the spell. That is not such a big deal. So... I think it largely depends whether your DM is going to play this more thematically or just straight through the text. If they play it straight through the text, I think it's an okay spell. My next favorite transmutation spell at this level is Etherealness. Uh, so this is a spell that turns you ethereal, of course. You have an 8 hour duration, so it lasts a long time, uses your concentration, and when you become ethereal, you can move through the floor, you can move through the walls, you can float around wherever you want. You're basically imperceivable from anyone on the prime material plane. Uh, they can't affect you, you can't affect them. Uh, so this is something that is going to be circumstantial, obviously. The first use is you're in trouble in combat, you cast etherealness. It's an action to cast, so you can do it right away. And nothing can affect you anymore. So you're safe for eight hours and you can travel to where uh, ever you need to go within an eight hour period and you're safe, but it's just you, right? So you're kind of abandoning the rest of your group. Uh, the other use is utility. You need to get in somewhere. There's no way in. You cast etherealness. Now you can just travel through the walls, through the ceiling. Note that you still can't get through force effects. So if you're in something like a force cage, you're still trapped, uh, but you can get through any normal substance. And I think it's notable to say there's an interesting upcast here, because if you upcast this as an 8th level spell, you can affect up to 3 creatures. So if you're in a small party, that might be your entire party. Uh, now, you have to be one of those 3 creatures. So if you have 4 party members or more, you can, still can't do everybody. Uh, but in a small party, you could potentially do everybody, and that could get the party to a place that maybe they've never been before, they can explore an entire dungeon unseen, and then you can appear wherever you want to appear. Uh, so there's a number of ways this might be very useful. You could even potentially take somebody 
ethereal, they could have a long rest while you're concentrating on this spell. Uh, so there are some niche uses here, some utility uses here. So I think this is a solid orange rating spell, uh, but I don't think this is the kind of spell that you're going to fall back on a lot. The final spell in Transmutation is Sequester. And Sequester is the kind of spell that I think normally you should just never take. It is one of those spells that has kind of a story related uh, idea to it. So as a DM, I would definitely use it as a way to maybe introduce a character from another time or those kinds of things. So Sequester, here's what it does. It's 5,000 gold pieces to cast. You pick an object or a creature, you cast a spell on them, they turn invisible, and they can't be detected by any means. So even divination spells can't find them. And during that time, they're basically in suspended animation. So they don't age, nothing happens to them. And then this spell lasts as long as you want it to. And then you can pick either a time or a trigger, uh, or if somebody dispels it, where they come back out of this suspended animation. Uh, so as a spell that a PC would take, the uses for that are just so insanely circumstantial, I wouldn't count on them ever happening. Uh, but as a DM, I would definitely use this as a way to bring back somebody from a forgotten time or something like that. But as a player, I'm going to give this an orange rating, but it's close. It's close to red because the circumstances are so, so rare. Uh, I kind of waffled between one and the other. I'm going to give it an orange rating, but understand that the circumstances for using this sequester spell are really circumstantial. So that is the end of my list. Next week, we're going to be doing our eighth level spells. Those build guides are coming up very soon. So until then, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax and I'm going to have some fun because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers, and I'll see you next time.